The young man, Ezra Miller, is one of the brightest and most talented people I know. As an actor, he floats between indie art house and Hollywood blockbusters with ease. And as a musician, he continues to push musical boundaries with his band Sons of an Illustrious Father. His first on-screen appearance came after dropping out of school. <laughs> Ironically, the film was called After School. This is followed by a string of roles on TV shows like Californication and Law and & Order. But Ezra's breakthrough came via his eerie and unforgettable performance in the critically acclaimed film, We Need to Talk About Kevin, where he starred alongside the incomparable Tilda Swinton. Cult classics like The Perks of Being a Wallflower and comedies like Trainwreck followed. But Ezra's star power was solidified when he was cast in two of Warner Brothers' A-list franchises, first as The Flash in DC's The Justice League, and then as the creepy Credence Barebone in J.K. Rowling's Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. From traveling to the Arctic to put a spotlight on the effects of climate change, to being one of the first celebrities to truly stand with Standing Rock as they oppose the Dakota Access Pipeline, Ezra certainly uses his platform to draw attention to some of the most pressing issues of our time. So I want to talk to you about movies. Sure. You've been acting since you were a teenager, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've been acting in film since I was 14. Mm-hmm. I've been acting in a variety of other silly sorts of stuff from a you know from a younger age but then I, I got really into opera I was an opera singer and then was doing a lot of theater and musical theater and got into film around when I was 14 really caught the bug I mean I still love theater and you know I was doing a lot of improvisational comedy and stuff like that I still love that stuff uh, but the film bug is a unique critter <laughs> so film since I was yeah 14. Did you ever consider anything else? Was there ever a consideration of another career besides exploring the arts? Uh, It's half out of, I guess, conventional finer creative arts. But I did have a plan at one point to run Ezra's House of Love. (laughs) My plan was to get a, like, um, like get culinary training. Mm Mm-hmm. And then get a massage therapy license and then become a social worker and be able to essentially, like talk to you about your problems, give you a massage and feed you a meal. You give me money and then you come back next week. It's like a therapist. It would just be like in my house or or maybe in like my mother's basement. (laughs) That would be Ezra's house of love. And you'd come and I'd be like, give you a massage. Now it sounds really creepy. But when I was 11, I was like, all right. You came up with that when you were 11. Yeah. You know, when I was, because really the real answer, Saul, I mean, that's true is I actually, did I would talk about that as the contingency plan, the plan B. But truth be told, there wasn't a plan B. There wasn't. I decided when I was eight, very firmly, from six to eight, it was the consideration period in my <laughs> life where I was like, do I do this? Do I make, do I commit to this? You know what I mean? What am I willing to do? How far am I willing to go? Then I was when I was eight, I was like. Committed. I stated it. I was like, dad, I'm going to be an actor and a performer, musician. Like, because uh, really at eight yeah, years old, a hundred percent. And I was very certain. And I, I, it was really, it was a conviction. And then I didn't get the, no, that's impossible. Well, Bob Miller would not say that. No. I've met your father. Yes. You what, know. Did, what was his response? He was like, wow, that's so cool that you know that now because you have such a jump start, and you can, great. We should go to a bookstore and you should get some books about like how a professional performer does that you know we went and got like the actor prepares at like a bookstore and he was like this is great you'll have to read a lot of Shakespeare you know what I mean (laughs) like and so that sort of privilege you know from a young age to be in in that position of feeling like supported and feeling just certain that it was what I wanted to do and so interesting like you say support it's those moments where like literally if your father had have been like brushed it aside yeah you could have actually gone a different direction yeah I mean my mother had an experience when she was young where where a a dancer came to her school and it was just school dance class you know but at the end of the thing this woman came up to my mother and said you are a dancer and she recalls that at that moment it was like someone had put a spell on her where now she had this special information that Mm. she could do this weird thing that a lot of people, other people would say, no, you cannot do that. That is unrealistic. It's not pragmatic. You can't survive in the world doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that that sort of support 
for artists is the most critical thing, especially when, when we're young, but also throughout our whole lives and our, uh, the creation of a body of work, mm. you need a lot of support. It's, you know, takes a village. Absolutely. What, what about acquiring skills? Cause one of the things I observe about you is you're very, you're very disciplined. You kind of consume information and somehow have this unbelievable ability to retain it. <laughs> yeah. You're the, one of the only people I know who can have a informed conversation about pretty much anything. And for someone who at such a young age to have that much, how did you digest all that information? For me, it was always deeply connected with the artwork. Right. So learning libretto, uh, for those of learning the words in, in an opera. That yeah. An it's opera. the, it's the, you know, it's the words written to the music of an okay. opera. My singing cured, uh, my stutter, which I had when I was a kid, I had a stutter and then I started singing and it was just this all consuming solution to everything. It made me so happy. It was like such a joyful, perfect thing. And the more I did it, the more I was breathing and the less I was stuttering. So I think there was something in the devotion to that where I was just like, I'm learning all these words. I think memory works differently for everyone. You know how they say, they're like different types of learners, mm -hmm. you know, like auditory or I think I'm emotional. I don't know if that's one of the official ones, but I think like it's like when stuff makes me feel. It retains. The the weird memory gift is is it's a gift and, you know, gift and a curse because <laughs> then you also remember like, oh, you know, when you like go back and you just remember like a time when you were 12 and you were a dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Or last week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so memory is, you know, but it's good. Yeah, I can learn lines. Sometimes I remember fun facts. <laughs> and and you choose not to use any social media. That's true. Tell us about that, like, which is in an age where, like, every artist is encouraged. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff that plays into the decision. And that reinforces it over time. I mean, obviously, it's these are amazingly powerful tools that everyone is suddenly using. Even just a step back historical perspective, like we've just all started carrying around these incredibly powerful tools and using this incredibly powerful new form of communication. And I recognize the potential incredible good that that can come of, of that and how it could be used in incredible ways. Um, for me though, I don't want to be so close to, to everybody in this artificial way. Mm. I don't want to be so close. I want to feel the space between me and, and this person. I think of artists I love, you know what I mean? Like artists that, I, that I was interested in, you know, they didn't, they didn't answer to the public. Mm because of the, where the technology was at. But then also I think there's something really nice about that. You know what I mean? In terms of like, I don't know, you shouldn't have to know everything about me, what I'm eating, where I am in the world at all times. You know what I mean? Like, th doesn't it make it all a, a bit less fun? Well, it's some magic. You leave some magic to it, right? Yeah, Yeah. No, absolutely. You're, you're right. Then again, it's amazing the way that social movements can use it. Well, that's the, the thing is we've, that we've not, you artists know, can use it to share work. And I want to be clear. It's not that you have some sort of like statement or disdain for it because in the work that we've done together, I remember we were laughing when we were on that adventure to the North Pole with, uh, you know, with Greenpeace to make this statement about climate change. And you did your first tweet. <laughs> yeah, we were laughing, but the point was, is it got a lot of attention and you did the promotion that was necessary. The work we've done together in Standing Rock and that community for years, you've always contributed in those ways. Sure. And I'm super happy to work with for campaigns all those or, right. people who do understand the tool and who are using it consciously in sort of direct opposition to those people using it unconsciously who take it out of this world of vanity. You know what I mean? Like that's the other thing is like, man, are we all just becoming narcissists? I think we all have to resist that in a big way. I know I do. I'll, I'll own up to that right away. And it's like this thing of being trapped in yourself. And it doesn't mean you love yourself. Right. It means you're in this constant, horrible, this loop of like, 
self-awareness. It's we're watching it play itself out on the biggest stage right yeah. now. These tools affecting like yeah. the president of the yeah. United States. It's, it's, like, it's people eating their own heads. You know what <laughs> I mean? And it can be really bad for you. That's yeah. why it's like, so for me, a conscious use of the tool mm. is when you're expressing through it. Mm. My dream is that artists are free to make their work and then not judge it so much. Mm. And also just us as human beings, like that we're free to be fallible people who make lots of mistakes, who are always in learning processes, who are not always pretty, who are not always, don't always look so buff. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, like who are not in a struggle between self-loathing and self-aggrandizing, who are in the middle and, ground, that uh, balanced right, place which is of self-love. Yeah, sure. It's where humility meets strength, mm. where you realize like, hey, I'm cool for the person who I am. The good stuff in my life, the bad stuff in my life, it's all been this magical play and it's made me this character mm. and like wherever that is. And I mean it to the darkest corners of where you can find yourself in this life. That's cool. It's interesting. It's okay. Yeah, man. That's beautiful, my brother. So you are now officially a superhero barry allen aka the flash in dc's cinematic universe wow can you talk to us a little bit about your perspective on indie films versus hollywood blockbusters you know i have a deep and lasting devotion to all works of art independent but like when i was a kid i was watching terminator 2 like every day, you know what I mean? Like, like the, the dream in film on some level was always to be able to participate in productions of every scale because there's power to each scale. But I've always held myself to a very strict diet of working on art. I really believe in and that a story that I not even just that I think it's going to be a good work of art, but I want to feel the necessity of the expression. I want to feel like it's a story I need to think about for six months, potentially, mm. or more. Or years. Or years and years <laughs> and years and years. Uh you know, because there were a lot of things that were really cool, but just didn't feel quite right. But it was like, oh, my gosh, but this is it. And they're offering. And then everyone starts telling you, like, this is a big opportunity. So you should say yes. And that might be true. You know, then you kind of sit around being like, OK, right. here I am with my integrity. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, what comes next? Maybe nothing. Mm. Maybe community theater. Right. For Evs, you know what yeah. I mean? Which is like. Every job offer could be your last job offer in this, you know, there's like no solid ground in this whole industry. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like everybody's staying afloat no matter where they are. Doggy paddle. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> doing the doggy paddle. I'm really proud of you, bro. I'm proud of what you're doing. You know, I love going to the theater and seeing you up there, but I love watching how you move through the world with integrity and authenticity and provide your, your gifts to things that matter and to your craft with a discipline and a devotion that is, dare I say, devastating. That was a lot of Ds. It was intentional, though. Well, I will say thank you, Saul. And I feel very honored by that. And at risk of becoming just a puddle of mush, <laughs> uh, we'll say that the feeling is mutual in, in, in ineffable ways. And watching you do this and engage in what is a, a really serious effort to try something ambitious and to try something new yeah you are inspiring and creating space for a lot of us and so yeah thank you thank you for your words but also thank you for what you're doing it's it's good i feel the mush pile <laughs> me too the I mush love you, pedal is coming <laughs> i love you too yeah man it's it's, it's a beautiful thing man and, it's, and it, you it's hear that radio <laughs> listeners saul and i love each other <laughs> We certainly do. We are and old it's friends. Only just we begun. love each other. It's only just begun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's coming next? <laughs> no, it's, it's amazing. Really fun, fun times. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Cue chill musical outro. <laughs> 1196 is produced by Saul Guy, Reza Daya, Chris Penrose, and Megan Eliza. Follow us. At Deus Creates. What?